So I'm wondering, had any of you tried and failed to interest an agent or a publisher in a, in a conventional novel before you turned to genre writing? Or were you always interested in, we'll start with Jessica, were you always interested in romance writing? Um, actually, my first six novels are not romance. They're um, contemporary fiction. Uh, my publisher was New American Library. So I had what I thought was a novel novel. Mm -hmm. It's about a girl who hides her pregnancy um, and has the baby at home. And when I began to market that, I found that I was, because I had a protagonist that was 15, I was suddenly a young adult writer. Mm -hmm. You know, so, it, it, and I thought, oh, I just wrote a novel and it happened to have a 15-year-old in it, but no, it's, it's young adult. Well, it didn't, it ended up being published by, in the mainstream. Um, but I write fast and my, Eight, my former agent really um, represents a number of romance writers. He says, well, why don't you write a romance? And I hadn't read one since high school, so I read 100 romances one summer, very strange summer. Uh, and um, I realized that I could, I remembered the format and just started to do it. And I didn't do anything differently than when I write, I just wrote with a format in mind. Um, and that's when I found that I had, once you step into the genre pool, certain things start happening to you. And it's hard to then come back out of being in a genre. Um, at least I've, I've found that now. But um, so it has been very confusing, actually, I think for them and for me. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's, we'll come back to that because that's a whole topic in itself. So, um, Lori, how about you? Did you start by, okay, maybe I have my facts wrong on you too, but. Uh... No, I, you're, you're perfectly right. Um, I, I think a lot of people start writing not realizing that they're writing in a genre. Um, and that was the way with me. I wrote, um, well, the first book that we sold was uh, A Grave Talent, and I thought of it as a novel. And of course, it's about a cop, and it's about a body, and it's about an investigation. But I, you know, what did I know? It was a novel. And uh, St. Martin's Press said, "No, no, this is this is a mystery novel." And I said, "Okay, it's a mystery novel." Um, I think that a lot of us who write within a specific genre tend to tend to inhabit that genre more because it's um, it, it fits what we do rather than we're trying to fit into it. And and I, I find that is with me. I mean, you begin to get reviews that say that you're, I love this phrase, pushing the envelope. All it means is that you're writing a book. And if, if their definitions don't fit it, sorry. <laughs> Another good question to follow up on. Uh, but Christy, how did you start? Um, well, I, I didn't uh, really intend to write historical fiction, so I didn't, I didn't start out that way myself. Um, I had an idea for what I thought was a very small, simple novel about a woman taking a teenage girl to Venice. And um, during the course of developing that novel, I made the protagonist into a, um, a history PhD candidate, and I realized that I needed to figure out you know, what she would be studying or researching and, and writing about. And I came across an event, an, an, a real event, called the Spanish Conspiracy Against Venice. And the more I read about that, the more I grew interested in that event and in Venetian history, and just decided to make um, the past a part of the book. So it, it sort of grew organically. I didn't quite set out to do it. But when I started um, reading the history of this place, uh, I was really fascinated by it and simply inspired to write these scenes set in the past. And eventually it grew to be half the novel. So half the novel is set in the present day with the present day character. And the other half is set in 17th century Venice um, with all the characters and the events that she, that the woman in the present day is researching. Um, and the, the funny thing is though, that although when I finished the book, I sort of thought of it as a, a mystery. Um, <laughs> It, the publisher who publishes it doesn't publish mysteries, so they know, they don't call it a mystery. So therefore, it can't be a it's mystery, not a right? Mystery. Oh, yeah. It's you know, it's really it's funny because you know they have certain um, designations and genres, and but as you, as we're all saying, is that uh, certainly with your, your first novel, you generally don't think about writing 
for a genre, although I think it's a very good idea. And once I had sort of figured out that I was writing this type of novel, I did look at other books sort of within this genre and um, see what other people were doing and try to understand um, the best way to write historical fiction and what I liked about historical fiction. And I kept with it, obviously. So. Hmm. So here we have the three genre writers, none of which started out to write in that genre. So I find that interesting. So I have to say, you know, we've, we're calling this, um, this panel genre writing, um, literary ghetto or publishing opportunity. Well, we picked that word ghetto, none of the guests did. <laughs> so I, I have to ask them about that. Do you feel that by writing genre fiction, your work is ghettoized? Sometimes, yeah, sometimes. Um, because I was, I was thinking about this question last night, of, um, and it's one that is debated endlessly on the crime blogs and the websites and in conferences and so forth, is um, the fact that crime books are not treated seriously um, when it comes to reviews. Well, I, it, that in particular doesn't bother me, except that if you are a writer, one of the few forms of dialogue that you have is through reviews. And if you're not getting serious reviews, if you're not getting the kinds of reviews that hit the, the, the front page of um, you know, the, the Times Book Review rather than um, you, you know, the one paragraph long mystery get ghetto, <laughs> um, it, it keeps me from having a serious dialogue about the books. Not that I think my books are terribly serious, but you know, I, I do take them seriously when I write them, which is a, a very different thing. So it would be nice to have a, you know, an honest dialogue um, instead of just saying, oh, here's a great mystery. Mm -hmm. So you're pigeonholed right away, say, okay, we know where we put this book, we don't even have to open it up, we'll just give it to the crime reviewer. Yeah. And she'll put it in the little roundup. Well, at least there is a crime reviewer. Yeah, I mean, that's true. Ro romance yeah. is, uh, I had to convince my little hometown of Arinda, the Arinda Books, I love the, the people there, but they didn't carry. I, when I walked in, she said, well, go over to Rite Aid. Um, you know, so I, 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 I mean, I think romance now, w truly, who's buying the, the, the women's fiction is right up there in terms of what's selling in this country. Romance, it's in the billions of, mm. of, of, but it gets absolutely, so there isn't even the crime beat or the, the little, um, there's very little space at all. In fact, some magazines, I, my publicist said, well, they don't even look at romance. If you send them, they won't even read the romance. So in terms of the word ghetto, mm -hmm. it, if you want to use it for all it, that word is worth, that absolutely romance gets funneled right into there, but yet it, it, it really is holding up so much of the market right now. Uh, book market. People go in, they go into Walmart, and I've actually seen romance r readers with baskets <laughs> in Barnes & Noble. Baskets! You know, you know I, I remember looking at this woman, she goes, oh, well, I read all of these in a month, and then I give them to the old folks' home. So, I mean, there are people buying these books, so I, I find it a real contradiction that here is this great market that is supporting so much, you know, traffic in books, but yet it, it gets no space. So cl clearly, financial success is a negative point. It's really bad. <laughs> it's beside the point. Right. Yeah. It's very bad. Yeah. Of course, not for you or the publisher. Yeah. But. <laughs> well, how about you, Christy? Historical fiction seems a little broader, so. Um, I, I think it's a, a lot broader, actually. It's, uh, I think, just this year, four out of five of the authors shortlisted for the Booker were writing historical fiction. Can you so, remind us what the Booker is, just in case? What's that? Can you remind us what the Booker uh, Prize is? The Man is, Booker Prize, it's, um, it's probably the most distinguished uh, prize for literature given in, for English literature. And it's, um, unfortunately, American authors are not, um, um, they're not. We're not part of it, because no, they're not it's, a colony it's all, it's anymore. The, it's England <laughs> and, uh, the former colonies. The former yeah, colonies. the former colonies. How, how does that? Oh, sound? we are Those a former colonies. Col yeah, we, you, we yeah, should so be. So England, Canada, India, you know, just about every other English-speaking country except us, uh, can authors can qualify for this prize, and it's it's um, it's a very highly esteemed. And so right now, I would say that historical fiction had a very bad rap about 20 years ago, 
and where I think there was a lot of you know, not very good historical fiction written, um, that it was sort of in the realm of fantasy. You know, it was sort of a once upon a time historical fiction. But readers today are much more demanding than that. And um, people want to read about history with some real basis in fact. Uh, so a lot of fiction, a lot of historical fiction readers love the fact that they're getting um, a real sense of history while they're reading something that's fun to read. And, and you know, within the historical fiction genre, I think there's really top-notch literary fiction and all the way to the other end. Um, I think you can find a, a very big spread. I know from my literary agent friends that um, it's considered easier to sell a mystery, say, or some genre, piece of genre work than a standalone novel because if the readers like your protagonist, let's just say in a mystery, they, they know that, um, the agents know that they can probably sell the publisher another book or two or 10 with those protagonists or that protagonist. So I think they like it if you come to them with a mystery. Um, did you find that? Did any of you find that? For example, um, Lori, when you were starting the first Sherlock Holmes, Mary Russell novel, were you thinking, oh boy, if this one goes, I got, you know, I can keep going? Or maybe did your agent say, this would be good for me to shop the second novel with the first? Or the idea for the second novel? Well, with the, the first? first the first one that we sold was in the Martinelli series, the contemporary series. And the, the second one was the Russell and Holmes series. Um, so that we tended and have most of most of my career um, to alternate between the two, and then the occasional standalone as well. So, I I am known as someone who, in fact, one of the publishers had a um, decided to make a virtue out of the fact that they they couldn't describe what I what I write by having their sales force um, given a flyer saying. What Laurie R. King writes next is always a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh -huh. That's great. So. But in terms of the series, when you said um, the Kate Martinelli series, did you sell one book with the idea for the second book, or was it always sold as a series, or was it one book that was became um, popular or was sold easily, and then you followed it up with the second one at some point anyway? Generally speaking, if you have a, a multi-book um, contract, um, you know, they are interested in having um, that series for, for at least two right. of those books. Um, the problem is that it works in the reverse as well, so that if a series hasn't proved as popular, they want none of the books, even if you have an absolutely superb book, mm. they want none of the books in that series because it hasn't proven as popular over, over a period of time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a, it's a sort of loaded situation there. Right. It's like the problem of getting a high advance, really a high advance. Yeah. You you get a million dollars advance, not you know, maybe people it we know. It happens so often to us. Yes. yes. <laughs> so, okay. But, you know, you've heard, I've heard of people like that, that were, um, you know, it was really too big an advance for that first novel and that person never made it yeah. back. Well, I think right now we're in a we're in a whole revolution of how that's going to work out in right. terms of getting. Those yeah, it's people. happening much less often <laughs> yeah. right yeah. now. Mm -hmm. Not happening now. Right. Which is good. I yeah, think. I I think it levels it out. If you got more per book, less uh, up front, I mm -hmm. think it makes a lot more financial sense. But I think the market, the way we sell, distribute, publish books, is going to be completely revolutionized in the next few years, just based on eBooks and. But uh, back to your question, <laughs> I was uh, when I wrote my first romance, I had been reading that those hundred uh, romances, and I realized that what romance writers like to do is to write multiple books with m the same characters, and a lot of one of the techniques is to have siblings or related people when you could jump into those stories mm -hmm. and then bring the other characters along. But I wrote my first one as simply a romance, but he. One of the characters happened to have two really good-looking brothers. <laughs> Just in case, you know, you tuck them in your pocket and you have the good-looking brothers around for later. And and then she off my my editor offered me um, a, a, a three-book deal, mm -hmm. assuming that I would <laughs> write those uh, use those use them up. Mm -hmm. um, and then the next one, I had I had a, a planned a similar thing. You, so, you had to find some cousins for the next I, one. Well, no, I, I I just changed worlds. I just moved into a new world and okay. had a new a new trilogy. But uh, I think 
I think it's hard though if if you know if they don't go well. If your first book goes well and uh, that's great for the trilogy, and that's so far what's happened with mine. But I think that if you have a three book deal and the first one tanks, then there's there's a, there's some interesting problems along. If you've got that deal, what do you do? How do you, you bring it back? Well, what do you do? I don't know yet. I don't, oh, I, I don't want to know. You, okay. <laughs> and this will never happen to you yeah. or any of you, but what would you do? I mean, okay, you've got the deal, so they owe you the money. They pay you. That's they the good you. news. They yeah. can't take it back. Right. So when you wrote the first book with the two handsome brothers, did, were you, and you said they're in your back pocket just yeah. in case, was that a conscious decision? It, it was because I'd noticed, uh, you know, I hadn't, I'm not a, you know, this seems very odd to say, but I'm not a traditional romance reader. Um, I've I read a lot in, to learn how the form. You know, with with mystery, I learned that there's I've re I read a f I don't read mystery either. I don't really read a lot of genre literature, which is probably weird. Um, but I I recognized there were certain things that I had to do in order to write this kind of story, and that one of the things people did was collect characters to use for later in the world and that the characters could come back. And so, yeah, it was very conscious. Mm -hmm. And how about you, Christy? This is a little, or you're always a little tiny bit on an angle to the questions I'm asking the other two. But in this case, um, did your agent urge you to write another historical novel? Or? Um, well, I got a two book deal. I actually, can everyone hear me OK? Um, I, I set out uh, to write a book that I thought had commercial potential. I didn't set out to write the great American novel or um, even a, a great work of literature. I, I knew I was trying to write a book that was entertaining. And um, I set it up to uh, so that some of the characters could go on for a sequel because I knew um, that that would give me a greater, a greater possibility of success. Uh, publishers don't want what they call one book authors. Um, they, they simply, they're going to make an investment in you, and so they have to know that there's at least going to be one or two follow-up books that you're going to be able to write, um, in no matter what genre. And even if you're a literary author, this is true. Um, people might, or publishers might take more of a chance on someone um, on the basis of a, a really strong first novel that doesn't have a sequel, but they know that they're taking a risk, and I think that right now um, publishers are pretty much risk averse. <laughs> so, so I think it, you know it's a good question. It, you know, you're asking, well, is it easier to get an agent? Is it easier to get a publishing deal if you write a genre novel? The short answer is probably yes. But um, things are so unsettled in the publishing industry right now that I don't know if there's any definitive answer. Hmm. For, for any of it, because um, as soon as you say one thing, you can point to an example of something that's just the opposite. Um, but I do think there is a, a trend for publishers to offer authors a two or three book deal, um, simply because they, they, they need the product to come out uh, to do the follow-up, because that's the only way that they recoup their initial investment. So it, to answer, answer the question, yeah, I got a two book deal and to write the sequel to the first book. And, and now I have another two book contract in which I'm writing um, a, a historical novel that takes place entirely in the past. And then the fourth book will actually be the third in the, in the original series. Um, I know Jessica is working on a contemporary novel now. And um, Lori has written a futuristic novel, so with all those novels I told you she wrote, I didn't mention that one. Califia's, Cal Califia's right. Daughters. Yes. Um, I think some people might <clears throat> believe that it's easier to write genre fiction because there are conventions in each genre that can help the writer imagine her plot and characters. For example, of course, in a mystery, they usually need, usually need a dead body, and finding the killer would be part of the plot. Um, in a romance novel, you need to have a love story, and historical novels are embedded in a, in a t time and place in the past, of course, that the author can research. So that might be considered kind of making things easier for you because you've got some things, you've got some starting points right away. Um, so I'll, Jessica, are you finding it harder to work on this new novel? I... Um, no, because it's really, 
uh, I started writing contemporary or literary. I didn't know, like I said, I was just writing a novel. I wasn't trying to write the great American novel. I was trying to write a novel. But I, I think that all literature, all forms of literature, all genres have conventions that you have to follow. I loved, I don't know if you remember this ad for independent movies that was out. It was Bambi walking on a little plane and all of a sudden something falls and kills Bambi and it said independent movies. It's like literary fiction, you know, you, 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 there's certain things you don't do. You, you don't describe your characters completely or you don't have a happy ending and, and if you do, you end up, you, oh, you're writing a romance, you know, so I mean there's this, you, all genre, I started as a poet, I've written short stories, I've written contemporary novels, I've written romance, I, my latest romance trilogy is set out in space, okay? I, 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 oh, so it's science fiction. Science fiction. I, I've had a blast writing in every different thing you can, and every single thing you write, there are certain things you know you need to do or not do because the reader is expecting certain things. So if in my romance I go off in some dream sequence like Virginia Woolf, I'm going to be in trouble because no one will want that. And um, I, so I, I think that if you study whatever you're writing, or you know, you, or you just write what you want to write, it becomes what it is. Then you have to know what it is in order to try to sell it to an agent or an editor. Um, and I think that's the interesting part when I thought I had written my novel and my and people said, oh, this is a young adult novel. I said, really? How interesting. <laughs> so I, I, I guess that's my answer to that. I don't know if I answered it. <laughs> so um, um, Lori has written a futuristic novel, as I said, so I don't know if that you'd consider that being in another genre or not. Um, but did you find... Well, well they're, they're all fiction, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that you, you need to, if you're going to write within a genre, whether it's science fiction or crime or romance, you, you have to understand the forms before you decide which of those forms you're going to take or not. I mean, I find it fascinating to look at over the last few years, various um, capital L literary writers have um, gone slumming into the crime genre. Can you give us um, some examples? No, I'm not going to give you any. <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, I, I, th I think we all we, we all can think of them. Um, in in general, um, even when the the writer clearly has a great deal of affection for um, what they think a crime novel looks like. Um, when you actually look at the story they've written, they're, they're only using a certain degree of the format. Um, I mean, in, in a crime novel, and especially in a classic mystery novel, um, the, the plot is a very large part of what's going on. And someone who is trained in literary writing, especially if they have gone and, and done a degree in creative writing, um, plot really doesn't do it for them. They don't believe in plot. Mm -hmm. And it's tough for someone who doesn't believe in plot to really immerse themselves in a form that is plot. Um, I mean, my books are, are more about character than plot, but even then, I pay close attention to the details and, and what's going on and how it works out. But it's very interesting how, no, how the number of literary writers who, you know, decide, well, this should be fun, I'll really enjoy this and I'll, I'll see what I can do and stretch myself and go into writing crime, um, what they're writing just doesn't quite do it. I mean, it's a nice novel, but it's not a crime novel. Hmm. You haven't found anybody that succeeded in crossing over that way, in your opinion? Yeah, yeah, I think that I think a, a number of them do it successfully, but they're not actually crime novels, and I think that they're always aware that they're not. I mean, Kate Atkinson's now got several in, in what, if she had started out, would have been um, put much more closely into the format of a mystery series. I mean, the, the novels are not a direct 
sequence of, of people, but they're related enough to make a series out of them. But um, this, the woman is not primarily a crime novelist, mm -hmm. and her editor is not treating her as a crime novelist. I mean, if she had my editor, those would be very different books. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't be better books, they'd be very different. Mm -hmm. Did you read Thomas Pynchon's Inherent Vice? <laughs> I, I couldn't manage that I one. I tried no. it, <laughs> uh, but it, it, was, it was a different book. <clears throat> then it, it, was, it had a crime, mm -hmm. and, a, and a body, mm -hmm. or parts of a body, or some parts of a body. <laughs> <laughs> and I haven't quite gotten through it, but uh, you know, I was thinking, this is very interesting. Mm -hmm. What is he doing here? I mean, I, I'm not sure how it all ends up yet, but um, mm -hmm. I'm getting there. <laughs> they're very fun. I mean, they're, they're really enjoyable books. Um, Michael Shabin's, yeah. um, the, the one set in Alaska, the Yiddish Policeman's Union. I mean, that is a sort of cross between a literary book um, and a police procedural and a thriller. Um, and it's a lovely book in itself, but it's not a mystery. It's not a crime novel, um, which, which although I think he was actually aiming for crime mm -hmm. novel. And he's a great promoter of genre fiction. Yes, he, he doesn't. Mm -hmm. He's not a snob about it. And, and he, I guess he does not believe in these categories. As you're saying, sometimes it's just when you, when you write your book, if it's your first book, you don't know, you know, you don't have a name as a certain kind of writer. OK, well, you know what? This isn't, you thought it was this, but it's really young adult. You thought it was that, but it's really a mystery. Yeah, the, the genres exist for, for sales. I mean, that's, that's why books are put into categories it's it's um the store stores are set up by category so that people can find books publishers publish books by category so that they can sell books by category to the stores and so it's really a label that is put on in in order to market a book but you as an author you need you need to understand what those labels are and what they encompass and if you're interested in writing a book you kind of have to figure out where your book would fit let's say in a bookstore you know where would your book be sold um is it going to be sold in in um you know just a general fiction or is it going to be sold in a detective fiction or murder mystery um it really helps to understand that what you're doing before you try to go to an, an agent or publisher. And, and I think that something that certainly I never realized in the beginning was those labels are put on almost instantly. I mean, your very first step into the publishing world is a, a label that you will live with your career. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I mean, for that reason alone, I'm very grateful that my first book was the contemporary series. Um, was the, the Martinelli one, um, rather than this rather whimsical um, Russell and, and Sherlock Holmes thing. Um, because for one thing, the Russell and Holmes would never have been nominated for an Edgar Award, which is a, a serious award in the, in, in the crime genre. Um, and it also meant that people who saw that come out as my second book um, thought of me as someone who did different things rather than, oh yes, she's that woman who writes those Sherlock Holmes books and she also does other things. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm very grateful that, that the Russell book wasn't the first one sold, The Beekeeper's Apprentice didn't sell first because I would have been constantly, um, you know, I mean here it is, what, 16, 17 years later, 19 books, and I would still have been saying, yeah, I do stuff other than Mary Russell, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Romance is category. There are so many categories of romance. It's absolutely astounding. And and within the romance categories, there's contemporary and paranormal and urban fan. You know, they just it goes on and on. And and some of those categories are looked upon more highly than than others. And you you know, erotica kind of gets marginalized and people look down on and paranormal with all the vampires was being looked down on and then true blood came out on uh, HBO and now everyone's rewriting the vampire <laughs> romance and uh, so I it, it is it, you're little you're labeled you know, and it's not necessarily it's for the marketing purposes really so the buyer it's right on the spine what what are you buying now in romance do you come across the same debate of pseudonyms oh absolutely so oh people are if writing. you're writing something different it is good to have a pseudonym so yes. that you're not con confused 
You don't want the right the readers confused. I've been told this. No, readers get and re, this one woman from Georgia wrote me a very angry letter uh, between my six, after my seventh novel, which was a romance, and she said, "I am waiting for the real Jessica Barksdale in Klein Books to come back." <laughs> you know, she picked up When You Believe, my first romance, and was was horrified actually that that I had done something else, um, and this. This notion of being someone else can be very useful because then you can hide from whatever aspersions come your way from writing in this mm. new genre. I was thinking it, it's kind of a, there's a, a good plus as well as a minus of, of being in this the so-called ghetto. And um, one of the pluses in a way is that um, you, you have a, a group of readers who like that category of fiction, and they're kind of there for you in a way. It's a great compliment to you that your reader was so upset. But she didn't write until she was mad. <laughs> oh, they never do. Are you kidding? I worked on magazines for years and years. You know, those letters are always yeah. complaining. <laughs> Hardly ever saying, love that article. Like, you got that piece wrong. So, you know, but. Um, or they would say, oh, what have you done to our magazine? Because, and this is what I was thinking about, you know, the real Jessica, yeah. because, you know, she fell in love with your book. So there's a passion there. And, um, and uh, so, you know, if, you, if I was thinking about this also with the crime page reviews, is that that helps you in one sense because the readers of crime fiction will know where to turn to look. And there'll always be six books there for them and probably your books get reviewed pretty regularly there, if not on the front page. So, you know, in that sense, you kind of are ahead of, of, of a lot of uh, contemporary or more general novelists, I would think. Well, certainly, um, as you say, because a lot of people who are fans of crime, you know, know how to access the reviews and how to hear about it, and there's a very strong crime reading community online and in person. Um, but um, the, I, I think that that's probably why making a living as a crime writer is probably easier than making a living as a mainstream writer. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very difficult to get published um, successfully, you know, numerically. Um, as a mainstream writer, um, if you don't have something, you know, some kind of a hook that you're, you know, you're, you're the president's daughter or your son. Um, so it's, That's there's, there's no doubt that, you know, writing in genre um, has compensations monetarily. Mm -hmm. Christy, do you think you'll ever feel drawn to write something set wholly in the present? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. In spite I do. of what we've been saying. Um, you know, I don't know yet if that's going to be a problem. I mean, I think I'm going to do the next two books, which are essentially going to be classified as historical fiction, and then we'll see. Mm -hmm. But um, I hope I hope that that won't be uh, a limitation. Um, it may be, but I don't think so. I don't think because I think because there's a lot more. Um, there's sort of a lot more interaction between. Uh, literary fiction and historical fiction right now that there's it's more of a it's not such a, a big barrier mm -hmm. um, but I'm not sure you know it'll t it'll depend I think there are so many changes going on in the publishing industry that it's really hard to know uh, exactly what the future holds for any of us mm -hmm. yeah it's interesting times that way um, one other related question to that is um, uh, just about being a, a writer a lonely writer. I've, I've heard the word writer defined as, as someone who can sit alone in a room for a year. So in that regard, um, thinking about the lonely life of the writer, I, I wondered if maybe a, genre's, a genre writer's life possibly was a little less lonely because that's a particular writing in a particular field with um, fans and aficionados of that field. <laughs> and um, conventions and seminars and, and maybe writing workshops and things that, uh, or, and maybe online things also, that kind of keep you a little more out there in the world than stuck alone in that room for a year. Uh, am I right, Ron? I, I, the romance readers 
are amazing. Uh, they blog. They I they ask me to come guest blog. They do contests. They are. Uh, I mean, I didn't have this experience with my first, well, the, maybe the internet wasn't quite in gear as it is now, but I, really amazing. And their conventions. The, uh, I've never been to this convention, but I've heard tell of the Romantic Times <laughs> convention. Uh, and the, the thing, they have a, the cover <clears throat> contest with the guys come out, you know, and um, <laughs> weird assignations and elevators and such, but I, I, I I think that it is a very strong community, and they are they are really uh, devoted to the genre. That I, well, despite my Georgian woman and her letter, I mean, I and certainly fans, uh, if you can call that, and you know, the fan page on Facebook kind of drives me crazy. That whole idea, but the the people who who like your work, I have found the romance community much more um, of vocal. Yeah, I think they seem to be very involved with the authors. They yeah, will, yes, really they want the contact field. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I think this is one of those months that I I I wish that there was a little less um activity going on for for this particular writer because I have something on every month, uh, every weekend this month. Um um are you traveling on, or yeah? Or on Tuesday, I go to Indianapolis, where we have BoucherCon, which is the big mystery conference. Which, by the way, will be here in San Francisco next year, okay. um, and I will be the guest of honor. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Ah, do you know um, which month? It's it'll be just about this time of year. It's always the middle of of October, um, and you know, so you go to these things, and there's 1,500 to 2,000 readers and writers and editors and agents who come together for four or five days and talk mystery books. Um, so you, you probably, you know, can meet more um, people who know what you do for a living than you, you'll ever meet, um, you know, in daily life. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but it does, it does tend to get a little hectic after a while and you think, um, aren't I supposed to sit and write? Isn't, isn't that what I'm supposed to do? <laughs> I think it, it really helps to be able to spend time alone. There's no doubt about it. If you're gonna if you're gonna write a novel, you simply have to be able to, um, you know, shut yourself off from whatever distractions or people or anything. Um, unfortunately, in in my world, which is not romance or mystery exactly, because I wasn't called a mystery writer, and um, so I'm sort of neither fish nor fowl. I don't seem to have those legions of people. <laughs> Mm -hmm. you know, who are supportive. Although I do know there is a, a very big group of um, readers for historical fiction. Yeah, I, just don't, I just don't websites. think they're quite as um, organized. I think yeah. romance writers organized because there is this lack of support in, in terms of reviews and mm -hmm. um, it, it really felt to me that they were banding together in order to support the writers. And there is this movement I think in the romance community to see romance as a feminist statement, meaning taking uh, female sexuality out of what was once something slightly forbidden to write about and push it into, to, and it's still there, this, this wave, and they're very s strongly organized and support each other. So. Historical fiction for me is sort of a staple of you know what I grew up reading, and it was never. I've been told at a convention, I gave my romance. Oh, I was at uh, the BEA, a, a signing at the Romance um, Writers of America booth, and a man came up and took one of my books and said, "Do you have a bag?" You know, he wanted to hide it because it had you know it was very sexy. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I think that there is no sh there's there hasn't been a stigma, I don't think, as much mm -hmm. against, romance certainly mm -hmm. has had more of that against it. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll ask you one last question and then open it up. How would you like us to view your work? S sitting on your shelf. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, how about uh, in our yeah. hands, open. I think, I think any writer just wants you to take um, take seriously what they're trying to do within the pages. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with a, someone who's writing in, in the crime genre, 
you want to you want recognition that you're playing fair, you know, playing the game fairly. But the joy of writing in crime is that you you can spread out in so many directions. I mean, you can go romantic, you can go historical, you can go, you know, very hard edge noir, you can go, uh, you, you know, really punk. You and and so long as you're playing the game of the the plot itself, the crime, fair. Um, you know, the the rest of it is just is just the joy of exploration. Christy, um, in, in regards to how I would prefer people to view my work, um, you know, I I it's funny because really I think what we're all saying is that we we don't really put the labels on the books. Other people do, so um, I don't really care if people see it, you know, especially my books are half historical fiction and half set in the present day, so they really are a kind of genre-busting book. So um, I would be very happy if people called it a mystery, historical fiction, or contemporary fiction. Um, I think it works on all those levels, and, and I, I don't really mind. I say I don't mind what they call it as long as they read it. Mm. I, I think it's coming to the book without uh, preconceived ideas. I wonder how many people have actually picked up a romance novel in recent years and actually read one without thinking, oh, this is schlock, or I can get it at Rite Aid. Uh, so this idea of just picking it up and seeing, reading it kind of with an open, open mind as opposed to predetermining what the content, content, content of the book is before you even try it. And I think I've learned a lot that one summer where I read 100 romances. I learned that just as with any genre, with literary fiction or poetry or whatever you have, there's some beautiful stuff and there's stuff that really sucks. And a lot of different variety uh, levels of writing get published in every genre. Things that you don't want to read because you don't like the writing, regardless of what the genre is. So there was a reason why that phrase, you can't tell a book by its cover, came up, yes. right? Um, I'd like to open this up for questions now. If you'd like to ask a question, I think you better go to the microphone so we can all hear you, or else. You can repeat it. You can repeat it if you want. OK. Okay, hold it. I, that was a, that's a lot to repeat, so I'm just gonna. Ooh, okay, next person's got to go. The microphone, though. The question to all of you, and particularly Lori, is: um, Have you ever mourned the loss of a character in your own book? Right? No, in her reading. In her reading life. Oh, in another book. Yeah. Uh, in another author's work. Yeah. Ah. Yeah, I think that anytime you're you're fond of a character, um, even if it's someone who um, y you know who had a good excuse to stop writing them, that is, they died, um, y you resent it. Um, you know why? You know why did Dorothy Sayers not have another half a dozen of them in the back that she just sort of kept kept there? Um, but at, at the same time, um, I'd love to. I loved a post that um, Neil Gaiman did on his blog a while back where someone was just complaining about George Martin and how he hadn't written something that he thought he ought to have written. And he, and he wrote back and he said, George Martin is not your bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, right, good thing to remember. I have to remember that you know these people, they're writing what they're writing. And if it's not what I was hoping to read, it's okay, next time around. Anybody else? There's someone in the back. Okay, could the person in the back find the microphone, please? <clears throat> okay. Um, well, thanks for being here, by the way, and your time. Um, I was wondering, you guys were talking about venturing into new genres and maybe being accepted, not being accepted. And um, I was wondering about name changing, like, how um, how that might, like, do you find that maybe if you change your name and just 
I mean, I don't know if you guys do that or if you've experimented with that, but it might be like an easier way to break into a new genre. I, when I, oh, no. my, my publisher asked me about it, my new Kensington, when I started writing romance, and I was thinking, do I have to get a social security number for that person? <laughs> and how do I go out on tour? And do I need a new website? And I really, and so I ended up not doing it. But I'm in a situation right now where I actually have a another book that is actually truly YA that now uh, it, it looks like it might be heading there and I am definitely going to be somebody else. So call me in a year and, and I'll tell you how I did. I, I think it's a very strange thing but other romance writers it's very well known when they write as um, I, I wish I could I my brain isn't working but it, when they write as let's say Anne Smith it's contemporary romance. When they write as Doris Small, it's paranormal romance. And it's, even though the audience knows there's one woman, those two people are acknowledged as separate, uh, separate people in a sense writing separate things. But I, I do think it's a very uh, strange, bifurcated way of being in terms of when you go out on tour, who are you? I have a friend who, who only writes one kind of fiction, and she, I think she's actually embarrassed by writing contemporary fiction. She writes, she wants to write the great American novel and has decided to be only herself when she writes the great American novel. So she has a pseudonym for these three wonderful contemporary novels, uh, and she does want to be known as that person when she goes out in the world, and when I call her by her real name, she gets mad. And I, I, th I tell her, I think she's like lost her damn mind. <laughs> well, I, I think that um, it's it's very helpful to have pseudonyms for, for example, um, the one of them that's been around for a long time is Ruth Rendell. Um, Ruth Rendell, when she's writing um, her police procedurals, is Ruth Rendell, and when she's writing her psychological suspense books is Barbara Vine, so that you're very clear. I mean, everybody knows that she's both people, but when you see a Barbara Vine novel, you know you're not picking up a police procedural. Um, there's also an economic um, consideration in this, because the way the publishing industry works is that um, the, the big boys dominate. And when I wanted to publish a science fiction novel, the futuristic novel, a few years ago, um, if I had insisted that it be published under the name Laurie R. King, it would undoubtedly, because it's not the, one of the mysteries, um, it, it would have had a slight dip in sales numbers. And that dip in sales numbers would have been fine, except the next book that came along the big boys would have ordered based on that book, the last book. Mm -hmm. um, a few years ago, when Martin Cruz Smith published Rose, um, lovely, lovely book, historical book, not set in Russia, not about Arkady Renko. Um, he had a lot of problems because the numbers for the book, not being an Arkady Renko book, um, knocked him a degree down. And it took him two or three books to recover his numbers um, because of Rose. And that's a real pity. Um, mm -hmm. You cannot say to you know, Barnes & Noble or Costco or any of these, look at, the, look at the numbers from the last one in this series or whatever. They, their computers look at the last book with your name on it. So if you're not doing a pseudonym, and you are doing a book that you know will not have as good of sales, um, you're taking a risk with the next three books down the, rig, down the row. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it's unfortunate, but that's how. Right, or even you if you don't know it. would do it. better if he had published it under a pseudonym? It might have done, yeah. I mean, if he'd published it as Martin Smith instead. <laughs> Be a clean slate. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Any more questions? Thanks for coming. Um, I just finished a book, and it's a young adult book. And um, I, I was trying to write within a genre, um, but it does have a dream sequence, and it does have, um, oh, 
lots of sort of adultish asides. And I was trying in a lot of ways to not write in a genre, but also write in a genre. Because to me, when I, write it, when I read a genre book, and Dorothy Sayers and Naira Marsh are my two favorite authors of all time. To me, they, it's, it's literature, it's, it's not just a genre. And I, what's exciting to me within a genre is when someone plays with the genre a little bit, usually. You know, when it, when it, it feels like it push, pushes the boundaries a little bit as you read. The envelope. Yeah, and <laughs> that's what I wanted to do, and I, I don't know if I did it or not, but is that, does that make it harder to sell if you play with it as you, you go, or is that just a, a writing question? I think, I think that's such a, subjective, um, um, it's such a subjective view that it's kind of hard to answer that question, because a lot of it's just going to come down to how, how do people respond to your manuscript? You know, do, are, they, are they taken in by it? Do they like it? Uh, is it? Does it move them? Uh, all of those questions are probably more important than did you write something that just fits in the genre? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah. I would say you have to write what your heart wants to write. Um, if the publishing world wants it, it will redefine the genre. If it doesn't want it, you can take a look at it and see if you if you badly want to publish that particular book, um, how can I reshape this book to make it do what the industry thinks it should do? Um, but if you look at um, the truly extraordinary books that have come out in the last 50 years, um, most of those have had a difficult time getting published because they aren't what everyone else is doing. Um, the number of refusals that you know that people have had who are bestseller all the way now um, it's because you have to find someone in the publishing world who recognizes the quality of writing behind um, the book and not just the fact that it isn't it isn't the form that they're expecting Thank you. Yeah. good advice okay thanks i think i'm going to need to wrap up so the next panel can come in so I want to thank you all. Yep. Okay, good. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you.